Well, welcome everybody to this, the start of our Friday night lecture series year. Tonight we have a very special program that might take a bit longer, so there might be a fewer questions at the end, but all of you here certainly can stay and ask more. I found this intro written by our speaker, Barbara Fankhauser, the president of the Portland Storytellers Guild, on their website, and I thought, how appropriate for all of us who have been dancing on the edge of COVID, isolation buffeted by the barrage of news. Here it is. These are the times from which myths are born. These are the days of plague upon the land and ailing kings of technical magicians who pull stories out of the air and send them winging into our homes to give joy and solace, laughter and relief. These are the days stories are needed most. These are the times storytellers have been preparing for for a thousand years. Tonight, we have our own storyteller. Barbara Fanhauser, who from the time her father introduced her to Goldilocks and the Three Bears, she grabbed stories and never let go. She began to write, and as she learned how to print, she grew up and wrote more, and then she became an advertising copywriter so she could make a little money while she was telling stories. In 1989, she discovered the Portland Storytellers Guild and discovered a whole world of people telling stories for the pure love of it. She joined and has been telling stories in formal settings ever since. In the beginning, her story centered on strong women and fools, fairy tales and elder tales, which I think there really are things like that, stories from great oral traditions and from her own life. The more deeply she immersed herself in stories, the more she came to believe that what ails society is the loss of our own stories. The stories that surround us today aren't ours necessarily. They're from the media or they're from some other source. And like fast food, they don't nourish us. So, in the last few years, she delved into the great Celtic and Norse stories that are at the heart of her own ethnicity. In that search, she has begun to discover that the strengths and weaknesses of these ancient gods are echoed in the lives of all of us living here in Midgard. That place there in the middle of the rainbow bridge where God and mortals meet, that is where the stories get interesting. Barbara Fankhauser. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne, for a lovely introduction. I always sound so much more interesting when people introduce me. And thank you, Sonia, also from the Friday Night Lecture Series for uh, committee for inviting me back again. This is, um, it's always a pleasure to come here and share my stories. And thank all of you for showing up because it's been too long that I've been telling stories to little postage stamped faces out there in, uh, in Zoom land. So it's just a joy to be able to tell to our real people out there where I can see your faces again. If you're here to hear a lecture, you're going to be disappointed because I'm here not to tell you about stories, but actually tell you stories. And um, I brought one story from each of the five nations. So the first story I'm going to tell you is from Denmark. And as I was saying, it's not Hans Christian Andersen. Can you hear me in the back? Okay. Um, it's, uh, it's called The, to the Toller's Neighbors. Now, 
there was once a young man named Toller who worked for a, a rich merchant and his wife. Now there was a young woman in employment with the same people, and and the young man and the young woman and Toller worked together well. And over time, they became attracted to each other and fell in love and and decided to marry. Well, the merchant that he worked for uh, and his wife were so pleased with this young couple's work, their honesty and their integrity and their, and their enterprise and, and hard work that they gave them a really lovely wedding supper. And the, and the merchant gave Toller a little cottage on a piece of property that they might start their life together on. Well, now, the, it was a small cottage. And it was on a remote piece of heath, very wild heath, that nobody really wanted. You know, it was just not much use. And furthermore, there were burial mounds on it from ancient warriors. That The rumor was that mound people lived in these burial mounds. Now, mounds people are another version of trolls. And But Toller, you know, he'd heard these rumors. and. Toller was a man of God, and he believed that you know you leave, you love, you know you do your best for all creatures, and you have nothing to fear. And so he and his wife settled into the cabin and the little cottage, and and um, they were sitting there one evening, and a fire was crackling in the hearth, and they were talking about how they were going to make their way in the world. And there's a knock at the door. Well, Toller went and he opened the door, and and in came a, a wee little man wearing a, a bright red felt hat, and. Well, he had a long beard and long hair, and, and I was wearing a leather uh, apron with a hammer in it. And, well, Toller knew immediately it was one of the mound people, a little troll. But, you know, the man's countenance was so pleasant and, and, and sweet that he wasn't at all nervous or frightened of the man. And the little man looked up at Toller and said, Now, Toller, here's how it stands. I know that you know who I am. And I, have, I am one of the mound people. And, and our people have been relegated to... The, the furthest reaches of, of the land. We, can, we live in these, these mounds where warriors were buried and, and where no sunlight ever comes to us. It is, it is our home. Now, it has come to word that our king has found out that you are now are, are living in our neighborhood, and, and he's concerned. He asked me to come here as an emissary and see what your intentions are. Do you intend to harm us or try to destroy us? Or, or may we expect a neighborly reply, response from you. Well, Toller was surprised. He said, no, I have no intention. I've never intentionally harmed anyone and any, any of God's creatures. I, I would never think of harming you, and oh, I think the world is plenty big enough we can all be able to live neighborly together. Well, the face on the little mound man, he's just, it's, he broke into a smile. He almost danced around the room. He was so pleased at Toller's response. He said, ah, we will be good neighbors, you will see. It will be good to have neighbors like us. Now I must go back and tell our king. Well, his wife, told his wife, got up and said, will you, will you not have a bowl of soup with us? And the little man thanked her and said, no, no, it would be cruel to make our king wait any longer for the good news that I have to impart. And so he left. And shortly after that, Toller and his wife began to see the mound people coming and going from the mounds day and night. And, and they did not bother Toller at all, as they had said they would not. And um, and Toller and his wife, you know, lived their life. And but gradually, they all became better friends. And and it came kindly to the place where the the little people would come in and out of Toller's houses, they as if they lived there themselves. They would come in and sometimes borrow a pot or a copper kettle and go away. And when they brought it back, it would be sparkling clean, and they would put it back exactly where they found it. And on their part, Toller noticed that in the spring. The male uh, mound folks went out into his fields and they, and they gathered up the big heavy rocks and they pulled them over and they piled them alongside the field so that Toller would have an easier time plowing the field. And in the fall, they all went out and gathered up the ears of corn that had been dropped from the harvest so that Toller would not lose any of his crops. And Toller, he noticed this. And at night when he said his prayers, he thanked the Lord for giving him such kind and good neighbors. And at Christmas time and, and Easter, his wife uh, would make a big pot, uh, porridge bowl of rice, sweet rice porridge, and they would leave it out on the mounds for the, for the little mound people to celebrate with. Well, a, t a time came when Toller's wife went to, went to her birthing bed to deliver a child. 
And the child was delivered all right, but his wife became quite ill. And none of the healers that Toller went to had any suggestions on what might cure his wife or, or help her. Well, he sat by her bedside day and night worrying about her and, and, and being there in case she called out for anything. And, and, but after a time, he, one night, he, he, he nodded off. He was so exhausted, and he slept for a while. And when he woke up before dawn, he looked around, and, and the room was filled with the mound people. There was one over there rocking the cradle of the baby so that the baby would sleep on and not disturb his wife. Others were cleaning the house, and there was one there beside his wife on her bed, spooning an herbal broth into her mouth. Well, when they saw that Toller was awake, they all scurried away. But you know, from that day on, Toller's wife got better and better, and within a few weeks, she was as right as rain. Another time, Toller and his wife were distressed about the lack of money to shoe their horses. They needed to take their horses into town, and they could not think of how they could get the money together to shoe the horses. Well, that night they went, to, they went to bed to sleep on it, and in the middle of the night, his wife woke him and said, told her, told her, there's something wrong with the horses. They're making a great commotion out in the barn. Well, Toller got up and he lit his lantern and he went out to the barn to see what was happening. When he opened the barn door, it was filled with the mound folk. They had managed to get the horses to lie down because the horses were too tall for them to deal with otherwise. And some of them were pulling old shoes off and others were filing off the nail heads and, and filing the horses' hooves and others were putting new shoes on their feet. And in the morning, when Toller came out to take the horses down to drink, um, they were shod as beautifully as if the finest smith in the land had taken care of them. And so the years passed. Toller replaced his little cottage with a fine big house. That heathland became fine, arable farmland. Toller and his wife did well. Their daughter, Inga, grew up. And so one night, when the three of them were sitting in front of their fire, there came a knock on the door again. Well, Toller went and he opened it, and with the mound man, he came in, only this time he looked far different. Instead of his little red wool hat, he had a, he had a fleecy, fleecy hat on. He had a, a wool kerchief around his neck, and over his shoulders he had a, a big sheepskin cloak. And on his face there was great sorrow. There were tears leaking out of his eyes, down his cheeks, and he came to Toller and he said, I've, I've been sent by the king to ask you and your family to come to our banquet tonight. We are having a meal. We would like you to come. The king has some, a grave matter to discuss with you. Well, Toller tried to find out why the man was so sad, but the man would not answer. The, the little man would not answer. And so Toller and his family got their cloaks and they followed him out and went across the fields to the, the burial mound where the entrance to the, the mountain, uh, mound folks dwellings were, and they went in, and there was a, a great hall, and they decorated with flowers that they found growing on the heath, and there was a long table, and all the mound people were there. The, and Toller and his wife and daughter were seated there at the head of the table with the king. But where, in past banquets that they had attended, there had been music and joy and laughter. Now, all of the little mound people were so downcast, and some of them were weeping openly, and others were just shaking their heads, and it was just this sadness that permeated the room. Well, Toller took the meal with the king and the, and the people, and at the end, the king stood up, and he said, Toller, I've asked you here because you have been a good neighbor to us all these years, and I wanted to thank you for that, for all that you've done and, and all of our friendships that we have developed together. But as you know, more and more churches have been built all through Jutland, and they all come with bells, great bells. And as you must know, the sound of bells is an anathema to the ears of my people. We've tried to stay. We are the last tribe here. Our other, our other mound people have left and gone on to Norway long ago, but we can no longer tolerate the sound of the bells, and so... We are going to abandon our homes here and move on. And we wanted to say goodbye and, and again, thank you for all that you have done for us. Well, Toller was heartbroken, and, and he watched the little people put their, their knapsacks on and take up their hiking staffs, and they left the 
cave and went up and out across the field, and Toller and his family came up and watched them leave. They went through the valley and up on the far ridge that took them down to the sea. They, they watched the little people stop and turn and, and wave back at Toller and his wife and daughter and then disappear over the edge, never to be seen in Newtland again and never to be seen by Toller and his family again. Now, before they left, each one of those little people had come up to Toller and his wife and taken their hands. And when they'd come to Inga, the daughter, they'd each taken a little pebble and thrown it into her apron pocket as a way of remembering them. Well, in the morning, when Inga took her apron down and she emptied the pocket out, those little pebbles were no longer pebbles. They were bright gems, sapphires and emeralds, topaz, rubies. Each one was the color of the eyes of one of the little people that had thrown the pebble into her apron that she might remember them all by the colors of their eyes. And today, the gems that we wear still bear the color of the eyes of those little mound folk. Well, I got to thinking about those little mound folk going off to Norway and realized, well, you know, when they get to Norway, Norway wound up building as many churches as, as uh, Denmark with bells. And so I don't know how long they stayed in Norway, but I was, I was thinking it was nice to know that to this very day they have found a welcoming home in Iceland where even in Iceland, the, the Department of Transportation to this day makes sure that the roads do not go through dwellings where the little people live. So it's nice to know that they're safe and, in, and appreciated in one country on the planet anyway. Now, also, not all troll stories are as pleasant as these trolls. And so the next story I'm going to tell you is from Iceland, and it is a far different troll story than the one you just heard. And I want you to notice at the end of the story, you will probably find echoes of this story that I'm going to tell you in other stories from other countries. Because folk tales have a way of traveling the world and adapting to each culture they get to. And this is Iceland's version of what you're going to hear, what you will know at the end. There was a farmer who kept sheep, a um, young farmer, ambitious, hardworking young man. He kept his sheep up on underneath these cliffs on the eastern shores. And um, he'd recently married, but unfortunately, he'd married a woman who was not at all like him. She was not terribly ambitious. She didn't really like hard work. She had no use for the household chores of weaving and spinning and, you know, canning and things like that. And, and well, the young farmer was a little disappointed in the whole thing. But, you know, he did the best he could. He, he sheared his sheep that, that summer, and he brought his wife a large bundle of fleece from the sheep. And he gave them to his wife, and he said, now, you need to spin this and weave it, because we're going to need clothes in, in the coming year, and uh, this is what well, you have to do this. The wife was like, right, I'll do that. Um, put that bundle of fleece in a closet somewhere and went on about her business. Well, you know, as the summer wore on, he would ask her every once in a while, how are you coming with the weaving, the spinning? And she'd say, oh, don't, don't worry about it. I, I'm, I'm dealing with it. Well, as fall came into fall and fall turned into winter, when that first day of winter came, the wife was home alone, and she heard a pounding on the door. Boom, boom, boom. She went and she opened it, and there was a very large, very old woman who was there and asking for a handout of some kind. Well, the, the farm wife went and found something to give to the woman that she, she wanted, and, um, and she was looking at the woman, she said, um, you know, perhaps there's something you could do for me. And the old woman said, what is it you need? And the farm wife said, well, do you spin? Do you weave? And the old woman said, yes, I can do that. Well, I have a bundle of fleece that needs to be spun and well. And the old woman said, give it to me. So the farm wife went and got it and gave it to the old woman. And the old woman threw it over her shoulder and said, I will bring it back as cloth the first day of summer. And started to turn to leave. And the woman said, but what, what, what will you want for that? And the old woman looked at her and said, not much. You just must tell me my name. 
Well, the farm wife didn't think too much of that, and the old woman went off with a bundle of fleece, and, and winter went on, and every once in a while, the farmer would ask his wife how she was coming with the weaving and the spinning, and she'd say, don't worry about it. It will all be done on the first day of summer. Well, winter passed, and spring came, and the, the farmer's wife began to wonder then about this deal that she'd made with this old woman, and began to think, how am I going to find out this woman's name? And, and the more she thought about it, the more agitated she became, the, the more nervous she became. The, the, she began to have trouble sleeping at night, thinking about what was this gonna, woman going to want if she couldn't come up with her name. And finally, the husband noticed that there was something going on, and he asked his wife, what is troubling you? Well, she told him, what had happened. She told him about the, the old woman who came to the door and took the fleece and said she'd deliver everything back on the first day of the summer and all she had to do was tell her her name. Her husband said she was probably a troll witch and if you can't tell her her name, she will take you. Well, now the wife was very frightened. She didn't know what she was, how am I going to find this woman's name? And oh, she got worse and worse. She was eating so she couldn't sleep at night. And she could hardly get out of bed in the morning and, and went on and on. So later in the spring, the husband was up in the high, up near the high cliffs where his sheep wandered and was trying to gather them up and was, had his mind on all the troubles that he had, including his wife's deal with this woman. And he was passing a mound, and he heard a, a chanting coming from in a mound. And he, he stopped, and he looked around, and he identified the mound. And he walked around it, trying to see where the noise of this chanting was coming from. And he, and he finally found a little opening. And he had to get down on his hands and knees and kind of crawl into a tunnel. And he got into this mound, and, and it opened into a huge room. And in the middle of this room was a, a very large, very fierce-looking fierce woman. She was so big that she held the loom between her knees and she threw the shuttle back and forth and back and forth and she chanted as she did it, hi-ho, hi-ho, ha-ha-ha-ha-ha. The farmer's wife does that. She doesn't know my name. It's killing true. It's killing true. She doesn't know my name. The farmer's wife doesn't know my name. Hi-hi, ho-ho. Well, the farmer backed out carefully. And he hurried home and he wrote down Gillentrude on a piece of paper. And he waited. And as I got closer and closer to the first day of the summer, his wife was almost apoplectic. She, was, she could hardly get out of bed at all. And so he went to her and he said, this is what I've seen. And he described the scene with the woman in the loom. And he gave her the piece of paper and said, this is the name she said. Well, the wife took it and she doesn't know, didn't know for sure if it was the right name, but it was the only name she had, so she begged her husband to stay with her that first day of summer that when the woman would come back, but the husband said, no, no, you made the deal. You must deal with it. Well, she was there alone in the farmhouse when she heard the ground, felt the ground shaking, and there was like pounding on the door, and when she opened it, there was this giant woman, but she did not look like a sweet grandmother anymore. She looked fierce. She looked like the troll she was, and she had on her shoulders a great bundle of woven cloth, and she brought it in, and she threw it down on the floor, and she said, now, farmer's wife, what is my name? Well, the farmer's wife, well, is it Sonia? Is Sonia my name? Is Sonia my name? No, Sonia is not my name. Guess again, farmer's wife. Ah, uh, is it Osa? Is Osa my name? Is Osa my name? No, Osa is not my name. Guess again, farmer's wife. Is it Gillentrude? Oh, the troll witch turned red. Her fury was intense. She picked up her foot, she stamped it, and she disappeared into the earth. And she was never seen in that area again. And the farmer's wife, from that day forward, she let no one do her own spinning and weaving except herself.
Thank you. That's, um, as you may have re recognized it, an Icelandic version of Rumpelstiltskin. <laughs> so the next story I'm going to tell you is from Sweden, and it is also one that has traveled the world. You may be familiar with Russian versions of it or Germanic versions of it, but it's a story that is popular in so many cultures, and this is the Swedish version of it. It's called Nail Broth. And I'm going to ask you to help me with this story. There's a little rhyme I'd like you to all learn, and when I come to that in the story, I'd like you to say it with me, okay? So this, the rhyme is, that which we must do without, there's no use thinking more about. That which we must do without, there's no use thinking more about. Okay, say it again. That which we must do without, there's no use thinking more about. Okay, can, how about once more with enthusiasm? <laughs> that which we must do without, there's no use thinking more about. There was a tramp walking through the forest late in the day. The sun was heading down. The temperature was dropping, and the houses in the area were far and few between, and he was kind of thinking he might have to wind up sleeping in the forest that night until he saw a little light through the trees. Well, he made his way towards it, and when he got there, there was a, there was a house, and he could see through the window a, a fire burning merrily in the hearth, and oh, it looked so warm and nice, and he could just see himself sitting there warming his shins in front of it, and he started to go for the door when around the corner of the house came an old woman. Oh, hail and well met, Granny, said he. Ah. And to you, she said, where do you come from? He said, well, I come from south of the sun and east of the moon, and I have traveled the world, and this is the last parish I've come to. Ah, she said, and what is your business here? He said, well, I, I was looking for, I was hoping to find a place to spend the night and perhaps a, a bite to eat. <laughs> I thought so, she said. Well, you can just move right on. This is not my husband is not at home, and this is not an inn, and I have no use for beggars. Oh, well, <laughs> Granny, he said, are we not all human beings together? Is it not written that we should take care of one another? Take care of one another, she said. Well, who's going to take care of me? I, oh. But, you know, the tramp, like so many of his traveling companions, never took the first no as the final no. And so he kind of wheedled and begged and brought her around to that she agreed that, all right, he could sleep on the floor in front of the fire. Well, he thanked her very much, but, and he went into her house, and he looked around, and he realized that she was not nearly as hard up as she was letting on. It was quite a nice house that, you know, she probably was one of these really kind of stingy, greedy people that complained about everything anyway, but... Never mind. He sat down and he warmed himself by the fire, and after a little while, he kind of looked over at her and said, mm, is there any chance that I could perhaps get a bite to eat? Uh, eat? You want me to feed you? <laughs> I, I have not myself eaten anything since breakfast. I, I have no idea where I would get my next meal. I know I cannot feed you. Oh, he said, well, poor granny. Perhaps it's me that should invite you to eat with me. <laughs> you are going to feed me? Well, what could you possibly feed me? Well, he said, um, lend me a pot and I, and I will show you. So she gave him a pot and he filled it with water and he hung it over the fire and he, he gathered some more wood to put under the fire and he blew on it a bit to get the flames going and heat that water and after the, the water was starting to heat, he reached in his pocket and he pulled out a four-inch nail. Well, she looked at that, and he, he took the nail, and he turned it over three times, and then he dropped it into the pot of water. She looked at him, and she said, well, what are you making? Well, he said, oh, I'm, I'm making nail broth. Nail broth? What? Well, no, she had she was been around a while. She'd never heard of nail broth. And she said, well, how do you make nail broth? And she said, well, just watch and see. She said, nail broth? You can make a broth with a nail? Well, that is something poor people should certainly know about. I would like to know how to make nail broth out of a nail. He said, well, just watch. And he took the spoon and he began to stir the pot. He said, now, the thing is, he said, this is probably going to be fairly weak broth because I've been making broth with the same nail all week. 
But it's what we have, and so he continued to stir it for a little while. He said, you know, you know if, if we wanted to make it really good, we would, if we had some oatmeal, we could put some oatmeal in. But that which we thou, must do without, there's no use saying, thinking more about. So she thought about that, and well, she thought, you know, I, I have a little flour, I have a little meal in my kitchen, I could, I could probably contribute to the pot. And so she went in and she got a bowl of flour and brought it out, and, and the tramp took it, and he began, the whole bowl, the, yeah, the tramp began to just put it in and stir it and stir it and added some more. It was fine flour, excellent flour, and he stirred it and stirred it, and the, and the broth began to thicken a bit, and the little aroma began to come out of the pot, and the woman watched and He's making broth with just a nail. How? That, is, I, that is just, I have to watch how he does this. Well, he stirred it for a little while longer. He said, you know, if this would be good enough for company now. Yeah, if company came, this would be good enough. But, you know, when the gentle folk, when they eat it, they usually add a little bit of, oh, maybe some, you know, some nice potatoes and, oh, a little bit of salt beef. Oh, that would, yeah, they add that. But, but you know. That's right. So, but the old woman sat there for a moment and thought, well, you know, I have a few potatoes in the pantry and a little bit of salted beef. And so she went and got that and she brought it out and she gave it to the tramp and he sliced the potatoes into the, into the pot and he sliced the beef and put it in the pot and kept stirring it. Oh, now it's beginning to smell really good. Oh, he said, oh, yes, this is what gentlefolk and they have when they have in their, their finest meals. They, they have this broth. It's so, yes, this is... It's really beginning to smell good now. But you know now, the king, I can tell you, the king has this broth every single night. Because I should know, because I worked at one point for the king's own cook. And when the king has it, well, what the king does is the king's cook adds a little bit of barley and a little bit of milk. But, but, no use thinking more about. Well, the old woman thought about that for a moment thought, hmm. I have a bit of barley, I could, and I just had a cow give a calf, and so I have plenty of milk. And so she went out and she got the barley, and she got the milk, and she brought it in, and she gave it to the tramp. And he added it to the soup and continued to stir, and oh, the smell was, ah, oh, the aroma of this broth was filling the house, and the old woman's mouth was beginning to salivate at the idea of this fabulous broth made only from a nail. It just, she, he stirred, and finally he stopped stirring, and he, he fished the nail out, and he dried it off and put it back in his pocket. He said it was ready. He said, now, you know, when the king has this, <laughs> well, the king and the queen, they put their finest cloth down on the table, and they usually have a sandwich with some beef and cheese on the side and a little dram of brandy, but... Well, the woman thought to herself, if this is what the king has, I can do that too. So she went to her cupboard and she got out her finest tablecloth and spread it out. And, and she brought out a bottle of brandy and a couple of dram glasses. And the next thing you know, there was a plate with bread and beef and cheese on it. And the, tra the, the tramp poured the, the broth into two bowls and they sat down and... The old woman was as pleased as my she and the tramp played like the king and the queen themselves, and they ate and they drank and they told stories and they laughed, and the old woman had never had such a fine evening in her life. And when it finally came time to go to bed, the tramp started to go over to lie down in front of the fire, but oh, she would not have that. No, he was too fine a gentleman for that. And the connections that he had in the world, working for the, the king's own cook, oh my word, no, he would have to sleep in a bed. Well, he didn't protest too much. And when he lay down, he thought it was kind of like, oh, sweet Christmas Eve. Fell asleep in a minute, and in the morning, the first thing he got when he got up was a cup of coffee and a dram. And as he got ready to leave, she pressed a silver, the old woman pressed a silver coin into his hand and said, thank you so much for teaching me how to make that wonderful broth with just a nail. He said, oh, well, it's, it's just in how you make it. And that's the story of Neil Bra from Sweden. So are there any fins here? Oh, okay. Well you're not, this story is for you. I I wasn't that familiar with many Finnish stories, but I found this one.
and it fits right into one of my favorite categories of stories where, you know, the, the ordinary mortals like you and I matching wits with the devil. And I, I love this story, and I love it about the, the Finns. So this is from Finland, and it's called The Devil's Hide. There were three brothers, three Finnish brothers. The oldest brother said to his two younger brothers, I'm going to go out into the world and see how it is. You wait here, I'll let you know how it goes. So off he goes. Well, he looks and looks, he can't find work anywhere until he meets the devil. And the devil has a position for him with the most unusual um, conditions. And that, whichever one of them loses their temper first, must forfeit a large section of their back side to, enough to sole a pair of good work boots. Now, I don't know if it's part of the Finnish, uh, you know, mentality, but for some reason, this young man agreed to those terms. And he went home with the devil to go to work for him. Well, the first thing the devil said to him was, I, there's an ha axe and a pile of wood out in the back. I want you to go out and, and chop the wood into kindling. Well, the young man had certainly done his share of chopping of wood, and so he went out, and he picked up the axe, and he picked up a piece of, of log, and he came down with that axe on that log so hard, and, and the axe just bounced off. And he looked at it. There was no edge on this axe. that You could not cut anything with this axe. Well, he just lost his temper at that. He threw the axe down. He said, I'm not working under these kinds of conditions. What does he think he's pull pulling off here? And he started to leave. But he was dealing with the devil here. And the devil caught up with him and said, excuse me, but we had an agreement. And you violated yours. And he said, I, you've lost your temper. And the young man said, yes, I've lost my temper. Who can work like that? I mean, your axe is, is a terrible tool, and I, and I cannot work like that. And, well, the devil took his share of the young man's backside, enough to sole a pair of boots. And the young man limped on home. Well, the second brother, the oldest brother, did not tell them what had happened, really. He only complained about how hard it was out in the bigger world. So the second brother went out to take his hand at, at making it in the world, and he had exactly the same uh, chain of events that his older brother did. He found no work until he met the devil, same conditions, he agreed to that for some reason. Went home, went with the devil home, told to go out, chop the, the wood with this blunt axe, lost his temper, threw the axe away, stormed off. Devil caught up with him and took his pound of flesh, if you will. And so he limped on home. Now the youngest brother, Erki, he said, okay, it's my turn to go out in the world, and off he went, and he ran into exactly the same situation as his two older brothers. No work until he met the devil. He went to work for the devil on the same conditions that if whichever one of them loses their temper first must forfeit a large chunk of their backside. Well, the first thing the devil did was say, there is an ax out in the back and a wood pile. Please turn the wood into kindling. So Eric went out, and he took the ax, and he tried to chop the wood, found it was as dull as anything, and he thought, you know, I bet the devil thinks I'm going to lose my temper over this. But he looked at the wood pile and began to pull the wood pile apart. And he pulled all the wood off, and when he got to the very bottom, there was the mangiest, ugliest looking cat you have ever seen. And he looked at that cat and he said, you know, I bet you have something to do with the sharpness of this axe. So he took the cat and he <coughs> chopped its head off. And immediately, the ax was sharp. So he was able to chop all the wood into kindling, stack it neatly for the devil. So that night at dinner, the devil looked at him and said, so, Erki, uh, how'd you do with the wood pile? And Erki said, oh, I did fine. I find it's all chopped into kindling. It's all stacked neatly. Well, what, said the devil? How, how, did you find anything in the wood pile? Well, I, I found a cat, you know, but I, I, you know, I chopped its head off and threw it away. You what? That was my cat. Oh, master, master, are you going to lose your temper over something like a dead cat? Really? Don't forget our agreement. No, no, I'm, I'm not losing my temper. The devil said no. I just, I just don't think it was a very nice thing that you did to my cat. Well, the next day, the devil said to Erki, um, okay, I want you to take the oxen and hook them up to the sledge and go out into the forest and cut some big timbers for me and bring them back. And I'm sending my black dog with you, and I want you to follow exactly the same path home that my black dog takes. 
after he says, okay, I got it. Follow the same path as the black dog. So he goes out and he went to the woods and he got these big timbers and he put them on the sledge and he's coming back with the oxen on the sledge and he's following the black dog just the way the devil told him to do it. But when they get to the devil's compound, the dog jumps through a hole in the fence like that. And Eric pulls the sledge stop and he says, whoa, I'm supposed to follow the black dog exactly, so if that's what the devil wants. So he got out and he got the ax, chopped up the oxen, shoved the body parts of the oxen through the hole, chopped up the sledge, shoved the parts of the sledge through, chopped up the lumber he'd gotten, or the, the timbers he'd gotten in the forest into small pieces, shoved them through and crawled through himself. So that night at dinner, the devil says, oh, Erky, did you uh, get out to the forest and get the lumber that I wanted, the timber that I wanted? Erky said, yes, master. Well, did you follow the black dog home? Yes, master. Exactly. Yes, master. Y you came through that hole in the fence? Yes, master. You can go out and see for yourself. Well, the devil went out and he found everything chopped up. And he's, <laughs> master, said Erky, are you going to lose your temper over a couple dead oxen? <sighs> No, I'm not going to lose my temper. I just, I just don't think you behave very well in this. Well, the devil was really annoyed at Erky now, and he was complaining bitterly to his wife that night. Just, I just, I can't, I, you know, this. He's destroyed my cat, and he's just destroyed my oxen and my sledge, and I, I, you know, he went on. And finally, his wife said, "Oh, for heaven's sake, if he's that big a problem for you, why don't you just kill him and dump him in the lake? No one will be the wiser." The devil thought, yes, I will do that. Now, Erky, being a clever Finnish young youth, overheard this. So that night, he went to bed, and he laid in bed until he heard the devil and his wife snoring. And then he got out of bed and tiptoed over and carefully picked up the devil's wife, carried her to his bed, put her in there, put on her clothes, got into bed next to the devil, and waited till a little after midnight. He poked the devil and said, hey. Remember, you're going to get up and go kill Erky. Oh, yeah. Thanks for waking me. Devil got up, went over. He took this big sword off the wall, went over. He chopped the head off of the person sleeping in Erky's bed. Then Erky and the devil, in the dark, carried the bed down to the lake, through bed and all, into the lake. Devil was like, done. Went back to bed, satisfied. So you can imagine when he woke up in the morning and saw Erky there stirring the porridge. He was like, whoa. Are you doing here? What? Uh, what are you? Where's my wife? Oh, Eric said, "Don't you remember you cut her head off last night and threw her in the lake?" But no one will be the wiser. Uh, the devil was up beside himself, and, and Eric said, "What? Wait, are, are, are you going to get? Are you going to lose your temper over what? A dead wife? Really?" I mean, what about our agreement? No, the devil said, no, I am not losing my temper. I'm not losing my temper. No, but I just think, I just think that was a really mean thing you did, Erky. Well, without a wife, the devil, it turns out the devil doesn't do well on his own, and he, he really missed having a wife. So he decided he was going to go a wooing. So when he got ready to go, he called Eric over, and he said, now listen, Eric, I'm going to be gone for a little while, and while I'm gone, I want you to build three bridges over the lake. You cannot use wood or earth or iron or stone. Oh, Eric said, well, that, that sounds like it's going to be really, really hard. Well, hard or easy, said the devil. That's what you have to do while I'm gone. So the devil goes off to find a new wife, and Eric waits till he's gone and goes out, and he, he kills the, cow, the, the devil's herd of cows, uses all the skulls to build one bridge, uses all the ribs to build a second bridge, and uses all the legs and hooves to build a third bridge. So when the devil comes back, Eric says, there they are, your three bridges, just like you asked, and I did not use earth or iron or stone or, or wood. Well, when the devil found out what he did use, he, he was furious, but, but Eric said, no, master, master, are you, are you really going to lose your temper over few dead cows, really? I mean, remember our agreement. No, uh, no, I'm not mad. I am not losing my temper. I am, I am not losing my temper. I just, I just, Erky, I just, I don't know what to do with you, Erky. Well, eventually, the devil found a new wife and brought her home, and, and she did not like Erky at all. She wanted Erky gone, and complained and complained to the devil about this, this young Finnish guy hanging around the house all the time, and so Finally, the devil said, all right, all right, 
tonight I will chop his head off, okay? I will chop his head off. I, I, yeah. So, well, of course, Erky was listening in. So that night, Erky put a, the butter churn in his bed where his body would be, and he put a large stone where his head would be. And so when the devil got up in the middle of the night and got that sword off the wall and came over, and he, he chopped down with the sword once, and he, he took a cheap chunk out of the blade on that sword. <sighs> He's got a hard head, thought the devil. Brought it up again. He came down again a little bit lower, and this time his sparks flew off the rock when the metal hit it. <sighs> He's got a really hard head. So he tried it again a little lower. He hit the butter churn. The butter churn collapsed in the hoops, and the butter churn flew up, and the devil figured he'd finally succeeded in getting rid of Erky. Went back to bed, and there Erky was in the morning when he got up. What, what are you doing? Did you feel anything? Well, uh, I felt some mosquitoes, I think. Yeah, I maybe felt some, some mosquitoes. Well, the, the devil was beside me. I did not know how to get rid of this, this, and Erky, the, this finished nuisance. And so, finally, you know, he was talking to his wife, and he said, I, I know he's, he's too, his head is too hard to, to chop his neck off. I, I, maybe fire. Maybe I could use fire. So that night, he told Erky to take his cot out and put it, sleep in the threshing barn. Well, of course, Erky had overheard the plan. So he took his, his cot down and went, put it out in the, in the uh, threshing barn, laid down, went to sleep. But before midnight, he woke up, he picked up his cot, he carried it carefully over to the hay barn, went back to sleep. Well, a little after midnight, the devil came down and set fire to the threshing barn, burned it into just a, a smoldering pile of ashes by morning. And early in the morning, Erky woke up, picked up his cot, carried it back over to the threshing barn, put it in the midst of all this smoldering ruin, went back to sleep. So when the devil came out in the morning, there was Erky in his cot, sound asleep, in the midst of this conflagration that had, ha that had happened in the night. The devil was dumbfounded. He said, Erky, did you sleep here all night? Oh, Erky said, yeah. I did. It was oh, good sleeping, but a little cold. Cold, said the devil. Well, now he was frantic to get rid of it. And his wife was nagging him more and more. So finally the devil said, okay, here's what I'm going to do. Here's the only thing I can think of doing. I will send Erky out to work in the forest. And you and I will pack up and we'll move to an island. He won't know where we are. We'll finally be rid of him. So, of course, Erky overheard that. So Erky went out in the forest, doubled back, and as the, the devil and his wife were busy packing, he hid himself in the bedclothes. So then when they got to the island, there was Erky. Now his wife was like, this is it's me or him. Either you get rid of him or I am leaving you. Well, the devil really liked this wife, and so he said, okay, I will try to chop off his head again. Well, of course, Erky knew what was going on. So he thought, you know, it worked the first time. Oh, maybe I'll try it the second time with the second wife. And so, sure enough, you know, the wife, the devil and his wife went to bed. And, you know, have you ever moved? You know how exhausting it is when you've packed up and then moved and unpacked everything. And they went to bed. They were dead to the world. And Eric, he went over and he carefully picked up the devil's wife, carried her over to his bed, laid her down, got back into bed with the devil. And a little after midnight, he poked the devil and said, yeah. You're going to go kill Eric, you remember? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Devil got up, got the sword, went over, chopped off the head of the person sleeping in Eric's bed. And in the morning, when he woke up and found out what had happened, he was livid. Oh, oh master, master, said Eric, you're going to lose your temper over, what, another dead wife, are you? I mean, remember our, our agreement. Yes, said the devil, I am going to lose my temper. You have been terrible. You, you, my cat and my oxen and my herds and my threshing barn and my first wife and my second wife, and I really love my second wife. I don't know where I'm going to get another wife I liked as much as her. And, uh, well, master, I will be on my way if you, just as soon as you pay me what we've agreed to. Well, pay you what I, what are you talking about? Well, master. You promised the backside enough to chew a pair of work boots. Well, the devil was furious. He complained and, and he fumed and fussed, but you know what? A deal was a deal. And so Erky 
got a nice big chunk of hide from the backside of the devil. And they became the finest soles a pair of boots have ever known. And he wore those boots, and he wore those, he is wearing those boots to this day. And those boots became so famous, the soles on those boots became so famous, people would come from all around just to look at them. And it was like they never wore out. And they would say to Eric, how did you get that much to hide from the backside of the devil? And you say, well, I, I just didn't lose my temper. And as for the devil, I think he never made a deal like that with a fin again. So I've saved Norway for last. Um, and the thing about Norwegian, when you think about folk tales, there's so many tales in Norway of this husband and wife just at strife back and forth where she wishes sausages on his nose and then he has to wish them off and, or you know, he thinks she can do, he can do a better job at housework than, than uh, she can. So many of these folk tales where there's just you know, the husband and wife disagreeing. But this is quite the opposite. This is one where the husband and wife truly love each other. It's called Gudbrand on the Hillside. There was a farmer and his wife, and they had a farm up on the hillside, and so he was known as Gudbrand on the Hillside. And the thing is that whatever Gudbrand thought to do, his wife thought it was absolutely the best idea he could have come up with. She was pleased with whatever he wanted to do. And Gudrun felt the same about her. And so when she came to him one day and said, you know, Gudrun, I've been thinking, we have 100 kroners in the bottom of our trunk in, you know, for emergencies. We owe no one anything. We have a fine farm that's all, we, we owe no money on it. But we have two cows, and I'm thinking one cow would be adequate. We have, we would get enough milk from the cow, and so if we only had one cow, we would only have to feed one cow and only clean up after one cow. So I was thinking, you should take the cow, the second cow, to market and sell it. Well, Gudbrun thought that sounded like a very good idea. So he put a halter on the cow and headed off to market and took the cow there, and there was no one buying cows that day. So after a while, he thought, well, well I've still got the stall and the food. I can just take the cow home. It'll be fine. So he headed back up the road towards home. And as he went along, he met a man coming the other way with a horse. And he got in a conversation with a fellow with a horse and the, found out that the man with the horse was looking to, to trade the horse. Well, Goodman thought, I, you know, I, I bet my wife would like to have a horse more than a cow. So he traded the cow for the horse. Now he had the horse, continued on up the road for a ways, and along comes a man with a big, fat pig. Well, he got in a conversation with the guy with the pig, and the guy with the pig, he was looking to trade or sell the pig, and, and he thought this was a fine-looking horse. So Gudrun thought, you know, I bet my wife could make better use of a pig than she could a horse. So he traded the horse for the pig. So now he was, you know, herding the, the pig on up the, the road towards home when he met a man coming his way with a big fleecy sheep. Well, he got in a conversation with the, the gentleman with the sheep, and it turns out the guy with the sheep was looking to trade the sheep, and, well, he thought to himself, you know, my wife could make use of that fleece, perhaps, and I think she might like a, a sheep more than she would like a pig, and so he traded the pig for the sheep. Well, he kept on going, and pretty soon he met a guy with a, a milk goat. Well, they got in a conversation, and the guy with the goat was trying to, you know, trade the, with the goat, and so... They made a deal. He thought, you know, my, my wife would probably find a goat more useful than a sheep because, well, she could make cheese from the milk, and yeah, I, th I think a goat would be a, a good, I think she would be pleased with that. And so he traded the goat for the sheep, or the sheep for the goat, and continued on with the goat. Well, he'd gone a little ways, and he, here comes a man with a big goose under his arm. Well, got into a conversation with him, and it turns out the man with the goose is looking to get rid of the goose, and thought that was a fine-looking goat, and so they made a deal to trade because Goodman thought, I think my wife could make better use of a goose than she can of a goat. I mean, I think so. So he has the goat, and he, go, goose, and he's walking up with a goose, and he meets a man coming the other way with a rooster. Well, the man with the rooster is, of course, trying to trade the rooster and thinks that goose looks fine, and so they had a conversation, and 
Goodwin thought, well, you know, my, my wife, I think she might like to have a rooster. I think a rooster would be a very useful thing for us. And so he traded the goose for the rooster and kept on going, well, by now, Gudrun was, he hadn't eaten since breakfast and he was really hungry. And he came to an inn and so he went into the inn and he traded the rooster for a meal. And he continued on his way, got home. Well, he's almost home. He stopped at a neighbor's house to get a drink of water. He was thirsty. And the neighbor said, so how'd it go with, the, how'd it go with trading the, the, selling the cow, Gudrun? Well, Gudrun said, well, um, boy, I, you know, you told him about the cow and the, the horse and the pig and the sheep and the goat and the goose and the rooster. And the neighbor looked at him and said, oh, Gudrun, oh, I would not want to be in your shoes for anything. Oh, your wife is going to have your hide. Oh, my goodness. She is going to, oh, you're going to be sleeping in the barn tonight, maybe for the next month. I th Oh, I can't even imagine being in your shoes. And Gudrun said, well, no, no, I think she'll be fine with, with the whole thing. I, I, she'll be fine. Ah, oh, Gudrun, you don't know women. She is, no, she's not going to be fine with that at all. She will be fine with it. Well, do you want to put some money on it? Sure, said Gudrun. A um, hundred kroners? All right, said the neighbor. So Gudrun said, well, you get your money and you follow me home. So the neighbor got a hundred kroners, put in his pocket and followed Gudrun home. When Gudrun got home, he went into the house and his wife called out, Gudrun, Gudrun, is that you? Oh, I'm so glad you're home. I've been so worrying about you. I'm so glad you're here and, and safe again in our, in our home. So tell me, how did it go with the cow? Well, he said, I didn't find a buyer for the cow, but I did trade it for a horse. Oh, a horse? Oh, Gudrun, that is brilliant. A horse, my, we can ride to church like, like rich people can now. Well, Children, go and put the horse in the stable. Well, I don't have the horse. I traded the horse for a pig. A pig, Gudrun. Oh, you have done exactly what I would have done. A pig, oh my goodness, we shall have bacon to serve our guests when they come to our house. How wonderful, what a wonderful trade. Oh, thank you, Gudrun. Children, go and put the pig in the sty. But I don't have the pig. Um, I traded the pig for a sheep. A sheep, oh my Gudrun. You do everything so well. We will have fleece. I can spin it. I can weave it. I, I, oh, yes. Oh, that is the best thing you could have done, good friend. Thank you so much. Children, go and put the sheep in the fold. Well, I don't have the sheep. I traded it for a goat. A goat? Oh, good friend. That is... Oh. I mean, I don't have a spinning wheel anyway, so huh, this is so much better than, a goat is so much better than a sheep. We, we'll have milk and we will have cheese. Oh, Gudrun, it was, what a wonderful thing we've done, you've done. But uh, children, go and put the goat away. Well, uh, I don't have the goat. I traded it for a goose. A goose? Oh, Gudrun, how great is that? You know, goose geese make wonderful watchdogs in the farmyard. And not only that, we'll have eider for our pillows. Oh, Gudrun, a goose is so much better than a goat. We'd have to chase the goat all over the hillside anyway to, to catch it. They, they were notorious for getting out. Uh, children, go and put the goose in, the, in, the, in with the chickens. Well, I don't have the goose. I traded it for a rooster. A rooster? <gasps> Good run. That's like having an eight-day alarm clock. How wonderful is that? Oh, my goodness. We will no longer have to loll about in bed. We'll be up with the dawn, and we'll have our chores done in no time at all. Oh, a rooster is such a great, a great trade. Thank you so much, Gudrun. Children, go and put the rooster in with the chickens. Well, I don't have the rooster. At this point, I was really hungry, so I traded the rooster for a meal. Oh, Gudrun, I am so glad that you took care of yourself. I, if anything had happened to you, if, oh, they're starving or anything, I just, I'm so grateful that you took care of yourself and you've come home safely to us. At which point, Gudrun stepped out and held his hand out to the neighbor and said, I believe you owe me some money. And indeed, the neighbor allowed that he did. And that is the story of Gudrun on the hillside. So, oh, I finished a lot earlier than I thought. Well, oh, no. what wonderful stories. 
Thank you so much. You're welcome. Let's give another round for the stories. Okay, well, we have time for a few questions, but I'm going to turn it over to Sonia to come out and find some questions in the audience. Thank you so much. Um, I really enjoyed those stories, and I was just wondering if you might be able to speak a little bit to the context of the stories. Would these have been shared with children, with adults, um, you know, just anything about the value that they would have played in the societies for these um, different cultures? Oh, I'm sorry. Are these stories for children? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Oh, oh, I yeah. I think that they would. You know, I mean, there are long winters in Scandinavia. I think the stories would be have, have been told to children, but also um, just as an entertainment. I think in in um, family units and family groups. Yeah. Thanks. Other questions. You have one? No? <laughs> OK. Well, maybe this is it. Uh, as uh, Joanna said, next, next uh, month is on the NATO, Finland, Sweden issue. And it's going to be presented by Veiko Valli, who's our local um, Finnish consulate, who has had in-person, in Finland, uh, access to information. So it should be a really, really interesting um, event. So please share that with your your friends. Yes. Uh, I wonder if, she'd have, if you had time to tell us a little bit about the organization that you're heading. Oh, the Portland Storytellers Guild? Yeah, actually, I'm not the president now. I was, but um, that was a while ago. But it's uh, been around for 35, 40 years now. And um, they have storytelling every month on the first uh, Saturday of every month, and then they have a story swap that is free for anyone that wants to show up on the second Friday of every month. You can go to their website, story, uh, portlandstorytellers.org, and all the information is there. It's a really, it's a really wonderful organization. With um, They also do, in the past, they've done workshops. Um, they stopped those during COVID, and I'm, I don't know if they're going to be starting them up again, I think. But um, yeah, they're great. They're all kinds of storytellers and all kinds of stories. And, and if you're interested in dabbling in storytelling, it's um, a great place to start at one of their story swaps. Thank you. Thank you for asking. Did you have a question? Oh, ah, well, me. Well, um, I, with the Guild, I'll be telling, um, I'm sure I'm telling with, um, a, you can zoom it, on in January, I'll be telling with the South Sound Storytellers Guild up in Tacoma, but I will be on Zoom, so, um, and um, I will be telling next Saturday with the Guild um, a, the story of Thor and Loki that I did here a few years ago, and we're going to be re freezing that, um, and that will be on Zoom. If you go to the Guild web website, you can um, get a, a reservation for that. And um, what else? Well, I'm going to be telling a few more in the spring, but I, I don't have a, a heavy schedule because, <laughs> I, um, yeah, I kind of like to spread out the stories. Yes. Thank you. I, well, I tell a lot of Scandinavian stories. I love the myths, especially. But um, I, my, my other half of my family is Scotch-Irish-English, and so I, I like a lot of the Irish and English stories as well, the Finn McCool and all of those wonderful characters. But mm -hmm. also I tell, I also do tell, still tell elder, detail, elder tales and, um, um, you know, powerful woman stories, that kind of thing. Yeah, those are my favorites. Thank you so much, Barbara. This has been a wonderful evening. Thank you. For sharing with us. Well, thank you all for coming. It's just such a delight to actually have a live audience again. So <laughs> I hope you enjoyed it.